Uh, a little bit later on, uh, Tim Bontemps of the New York Post will uh, join us. Also, Glenn Healy from Hockey Night in Canada, Bob Elliott of the uh, Toronto Sun. We're uh, pleased to be joined in studio by the Executive Vice President of the Baltimore Orioles. John Angelos is uh, with us. John, good to meet you. How are you? Great. I'm great. Great to meet you guys. Um, I assume this is not your first trip up to Toronto. It is not. I love Toronto. been coming for many years. Um, do you try and, um, and get on the road as often as you can with the team? How many, how many games would you, would you go out for? I'd go out for 81 away games if I could. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I haven't been able to justify that. Um, but, you know, spring training, client trips, things like that, New York, Toronto, all the fun cities. But um, not, it can never be enough. Baseball's great, home and away. Um, give us your general thoughts on your team this year and, and go, going into this year and where you sit right now. You're pretty comfortable with what you got? Um, we're giving away a T-shirt in a couple of days in Baltimore, Camden Yards, and it says, Buck likes our guys. So if Buck Showalter likes our guys, that's the only opinion that counts. But we, we, you know, Buck, Buck and Dan Duquette have done a great job with our team in the last three years. They're really the architects of it. You know, when you're in ownership, when you're in the business side, your, your role is to give those guys the resources they need and, and rely on their opinions and, and try and build a franchise that way. And those guys have built it the old fashioned way, the old Oriole ways of uh, uh, the Earl Weaver uh, Oriole tradition. Um, um, you know, build pitching and defense and scouting and player development, which is, you know, the place you probably don't want to be from a baseball side and from a business side is you don't want to be in a place where you're building around uh, position players and a lot of free agency and you're not focusing on your scouting and player development because that's how you get in trouble. But you, you did make some moves in terms of free agency. Um, you have, you know, uh, spent the money, taken, taken the risk, if you will, of, uh, of free agency. So, um, in essence, I guess what you're saying is we will do the free agent thing as a small piece of the puzzle, but you can't build the base through just spending money. You can't and you cannot. I think unless you're one of those few one, two, or three clubs in certain markets that are way out on the stratosphere and they can sort of play with funny money. I think you can then sort of make up for a, a multitude of sins by just buying players here and there and everywhere. But for most clubs, 26 clubs, 25 clubs, um, that's not the way to do it. You've got to build with scouting and, and, and player development. Just out of interest, what's the approximate payroll of the uh, Orioles this year? We'll, we'll probably be you, – you'll see different numbers in the media because people include different things. Sure. But in terms of, of, of just salary, we'll probably be in a $95, $100 million plus – benefits and and other things that go into it but um that's sort of the base salary number and ownership is comfortable with with that number you think that's the number you sort of have to be at um i you know obviously as you build as you start to build some momentum and and, and fans start to come in the door and 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 so forth you can start to start to you move that, that number up, up. yeah i mean I, and we don't go into it with any arbitrary number as you say you know this year we stepped up and we i, I actually met with a group of people and gave a little speech and, and somebody said to me well you know there's a lot of talk in the media about how you guys sometimes miss out on free agency and and don't sign players and i said well it, you know we're building scouting and player development we're going to keep signing guys we we signed Nick Marquez we signed Adam Jones we signed Brian Roberts we most recently Adam Jones to a significant contract for core a, guys for a great player yeah. and um and I said but we're not done and 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 then shortly after that we signed you know Ubaldo Jimenez so that was but we hadn't done that in a while and I think cuz it was it was too soon for us we hadn't built that foundation yeah butch yeah when what was the process when you decided on buck because his reputation is as he, he's an extreme preparation guy, extremely organized, intelligent about the game in all phases, um, understands the depth from, I believe, not only his roster, but, but back through some of his minor league prospects. Can you just walk us through, you know, what you guys were thinking um, when the job was open? You know, I, I, I think the the process, we, we've had a couple managers, and, and we've on the team, our ownership group, which is made up of a variety of people, including the uh, – uh, Barry Levinson, the director, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pam Shriver, the tennis player, Tom sure. Clancy, who unfortunately recently passed away, the, the, the famous author, and others. Jim McKay from the Wide sure. World of Sports right. is part of our group. And so we tried to take um, a, a, an old school approach. That is, you know, let's make sure that we really have people as, as your GM and as your manager who kind of remember how they got there. And I think Buck, maybe more than anybody I've ever met in my 20 years being having the good fortune to be exposed to professional sports really i mean he really is like your favorite high school basketball coach or high school baseball coach like the guy that's the aau coach that all the kids love he has a tremendous ability to find not only talent but 
but to create chemistry and to pick guys for chemistry. And then, you know, Brady Anderson, who was a, a, a great Oriole player for me, one of the better leadoff hitters in the history of baseball, um, is now one of our coaches and one of our VPs in our front office. Brady made the comment that in his 20 years of playing pro ball, and including going back to when he played college ball at UC Irvine, et cetera, he'd never been around a team that had as good chemistry as this club does. Now, that's a, a, a tribute to the guys, sure. you know, that they're, it's not the old Red Sox line about 25 guys and 25 cabs, you know, sure. it, you know they're the opposite. They, they like each other. They hang together. They're, they're sort of a, a, a clean living kind of group sure. and, 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 you know, not out sort of, you know, burning the midnight oil, which is always good. But I think Buck, and that's a tribute to Buck and Dan for selecting for guys like that and, and trying to make sure that guys fit together as a unit. And aren't just names you hang on a marquee and say, "Look, we're going to play well," because that that gets you to spring training, and that's about as right. far. Then you start playing the games. So, <laughs> um, why do you think Buck was out of baseball for as long as he was? Oh, you know, it, it, it's funny. I you hear a million stories about guys, it, both players and coaches, and you know, there, there are so many guys that give them thumbs up and thumbs down. And, and the thing I, you, I've heard, you know, I I had heard about about Buck was he's so great at putting a team together. He sort of in Buck, you sort of have a, a manager and a GM all in one. Mm -hmm. He can he can sort of do all of that. I think that's one of the things Dan likes about him. I mean, you know, uh, I, I I think the the, the com some of the comments about Buck, which I've never found to be true, was he sort of wears out his welcome or something like that. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. He he's such a level headed guy and such a guy that really cares about the players and really lives every pitch and is in there really working hard at it. You know, morning, noon, and night. Um, he's more like those stories I've heard about football coaches that just live the video and are in there obsessing over every second of, of, of play and of, of, of the game plan. He's that kind of guy. So, you know, I, I would imagine Buck's going to be with us uh, for as long as he'd like to be. But isn't it, isn't it, isn't there a need for the GM and the coach? It's best when they're all clicking, same mentality. You know, when one's not covering the other one, the other one's got him covered. And I think that, you know, I hear that in your voice. That's what you feel you have with these two. There's a huge energy in the last three years that we never had. Um, I would say we never had. Obviously, we were successful in the late 90s, mm -hmm. and we, we won some games, and we had high payrolls then, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, 97, the Orioles led the league in, in payroll at like 61 million, which is sort of hard to believe when you look back on it. And I think every year after that, the Yankees, you know, blew everybody away pretty much with maybe a few exceptions here and there. Um, so... You know, uh, I, I think the the buck. You know, we haven't had that kind of feel around the clubhouse. Um, we've totally revamped our strength, and it's not just one thing. You know, Dan Duquette, you got to sign on and say, what are we going to do with all through the system? Right. Nutrition, strength right. and conditioning, off season conditioning. Yep. Not having guys show up at spring training, twenty pounds overweight, and then right. work it off. You know, that's you get you come out of the gate badly. You usually, don't finish well. So that that I think Buck and Dan have done a good job with that. With uh, John Angelos, the executive vice president of the Baltimore Orioles. Um, this is an interesting division. Um, I need, don't need to tell you that. <laughs> um, <laughs> with, uh, with the Yankees spending close to $200 million, the Red Sox not far behind. Uh, the Blue Jays have upped their ante. They're pretty close to 150 You mentioned you were you know, just under 100 mm -hmm. and And then there's Tampa. And yet <laughs> nobody overlooks Tampa anymore because mm -hmm. they just keep churning out quality young players and and good baseball teams year after year um and every once in a while the fans here will become chagrined with the fate of this organization because how can we compete with the dollars and cents of the yankees and the red sox who don't have to retool or rebuild all they have to do is retool all they have to do is throw some money at it, and whatever hole cr is created, however it's created, they can plug it. Does that same kind of conversation take place in Baltimore? Like, we're in this division. Boy, this is, somehow this is unfair. Yes, of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> it takes place in San Diego, Pittsburgh, and Milwaukee, all sorts of markets. Absolutely. And I think I think the, the, the commissioner and, and, the, and, the, and the owners and the union have done a lot of good things. To try and move the league towards greater and greater parity and, and 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 competitive balance, but to say that Major League Baseball is where, as just to use one league as an example, where the NFL is in terms of competitive balance would would not be an accurate statement. 
one of the one of the elegant things that the NFL does is create some tremendous competitive balance. They've got a lot of mechanisms and they work re- really well. So you have a, you have if you want to have thirty two teams in, in in all those markets and you want to include markets like Green Bay, mm-hmm. Jacksonville, and, and other more Indianapolis. Right. And, and you know it's interesting. Look at Indianapolis, not the biggest market in the world. They're going to play what a quarter century, about. They're going to have two quarterbacks. Right. Under a different system. Interesting. Yeah. Under a different system, a, a less good system than the NFL has. They've got a great system. Uh, Peyton Manning would have played for the New York Giants probably by the fifth or sixth or seventh year he played in the league. And Andrew Luck probably the same thing. So what a great benefit that the that the fans in Indianapolis, as a as a relatively small market, can watch these great quarterbacks. For, and, and keep them on the team and not just see them float away to a bigger market. So what's the economic answer for baseball then? If it's not a salary cap per se, um, and when I say salary cap, I understand there are some restrictions that exist in baseball, but not the same way you see in the National Hockey League, the NBA, the NFL. Um, if not that, then how do you get closer to that at least perceived parity? Can I, can I add this also? In conjunction with the Players Association... <laughs> Because baseball probably has the strongest players association of any. Well, it has the longest labor piece, too, in of professional sport. Uh, right, ironically, right? Because yeah, it, it is an idea. irony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, how do you, how do you solve that problem? I, 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 think, I think you have to start thinking about it in terms of not just players and, this, and not just owners and even not just agents, elite agents, because everybody's got their take right. on it. I think if you start thinking about it in terms of the fans, you start thinking about what's it like to be a fan in Kansas City. Or, yeah. Let me ask you this. Is it easier to be a fan of, of, of the Chiefs or the Royals? And, and, and then you have to say we want it to be the case that it's as easy or easier to be a fan of the Royals as it is to be a fan of the Chiefs and to feel like your team has a chance, just as good a chance as the team in New York or L.A. or Chicago or what have you. I mean, that, that's the goal. So if you think about it in terms of the fans or the taxpayers that finance stadiums, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, every taxpayer dollar should be equal, right? I mean, if you put a dollar in in Toronto, it should be equal to a dollar in in New York or a dollar in in, uh, in in Pittsburgh or Baltimore or San Diego. So I think if you start thinking about it that way, how do you make it so that every fan is created equal and every taxpayer-supported, subsidized facility is created equal – then you start to move yourself towards rules that make a lot of sense. The NFL, I think, has done it um, for a variety of reasons, but but I think they think it makes it a be- uh, the better best game it can be. Well, but so let me throw something at you that 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 I've thought a lot about, and that is, um, and, and we understand that the NFL has certain inherent rules and regulations that it has a salary cap, but what it also has is a flex schedule. They attempt to balance the schedule on an annual basis based upon the performance of the team the year before. It's not always successful. There are always going to be some inequities. You still have to play X number of games against teams in your own division, your own conference. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, there is a, an effort to take the schedule each year as an isolated year and say, okay, this team is um, a below 500 team. We're going to try and give them some games against teams that are their, their equal. Mm-hmm. We all know in the American League East, you got 19 games <laughs> against the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Rays, and the Blue Jays. Seventy or the six games, um, almost half your season is against is just clubbing each other. Uh, what if there was more of a flex in that schedule? You don't have to deal with economics. All you have to deal with is results and record. That that that's definitely one one mechanism you can use. And I is and, it being talked about at all? Yeah, sure. They they talked about going back to a balanced schedule and, yeah. and, and versus this unbalanced schedule. Right. Um, but, you know, there's, like all things in life, there's a give and take there. I mean, I will tell you, you know, it, especially in the last three or three years or so, we, we've, we've, we've held our own with the Yankees and Red Sox. Gotcha. Prior, prior to that, we weren't holding our own. But one of the benefits that we had was we had a lot of fans coming to Camden Yards. Correct. Part of that's because Camden Yards has a great brand and people know right. it. It wasn't just because fans travel with the team right. uh, of the Red fans of the Red Sox and Yankees but we get those fans so you got to take the good with the bad the question is how do you create a league so that Red Sox fans want to come to Camden Yards Orioles fans want to go to Fenway Park so you've got this commerce this economic activity this this vibe this energy about the game which is what you want mm-hmm. 
but you don't have it such that whoever has the larger Nielsen market has the larger payroll and then wins wins more games. Now, right. now other mechanisms, and the commissioner's done a great job. I mean, the other thing the NFL has more playoff spots. Right. And the NFL has a reverse order draft that is a college draft, so it's an impactful draft. Right. They don't draft guys right. and, and have them around for five right. to seven years. They bring them to training camp, they make it, they cut it. Right. The only interim step might be a taxi squad berth right. or something like right. that. So, so that gives football a big advantage too. And there's not a lot that anybody can do about that. The question though really is, well, can the commissioner, with all the good things he's done to create parity, can he do more? Is there more that can responsibly be done? And, 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 and you know, when you have these huge payroll disparities, I think the fans ask about that. They ask us about it. Well, what, the questions we're talking about here, yeah. fans ask that, well, you know, I'm a fan of the Pirates, you know, and now they've done well. Um, but people wonder how long will they have their players and, and if they re-sign them, if they re-sign them McCutcheon, that's great. But will will eventually the rubber hit the road and they not be able to sign the other guys? Can't, it was like Tampa. They can't. They they can pick and choose the odd guy that they can keep. But then they've got to be. They've got to intelligently look at the guys that they would like to keep, but financially cannot, and have to try and turn them in to future players. And they have a tremendous success in doing that. But it's pretty hard. To, I'm sure to be a a Rays fan, and watch this constant, even though your team is competitive, constant turnover, familiar faces, you know a lot of them aren't going to be there for their entire careers. It's just an inevitability. It's the only way for them to do business. Right, and I think I think the unfortunate, there are many unfortunate sides to that. One of them that doesn't get talked about a lot is sometimes it will be said, well, look at, look at Tampa Bay. They, they achieved notwithstanding all the hurdles that were in their path. I, I sometimes look at that the other way. I say, wouldn't it have been interesting? Interesting is probably a soft word for it. Wouldn't it have been exciting for the fans of Tampa and maybe for baseball fields and ge- fans in general to see how m- many games the Rays could have buried the division by in some of those years when they did win the division miraculously had there had there been an even playing field right. if they had the same payroll just leave the orioles and the jays out of it since we're biased probably on yeah. that on the Fair in this enough. room let's just take the rays the yankees and the red sox in those years when the rays did win a division by however many games and i don't remember how let's say it was five i don't know what it was okay. with even payrolls there's there's an argument there's a right. scenario where they just they they just run away from the red sox and yankees and beat them by 10 15 games who knows? But you don't. You'll never know that until you have more of an even playing field. Now that all said, baseball sold selling seventy five million tickets a year, which is a lot of games, but a lot of a lot of people coming and sitting in seats, and that's you know more than the other three sports combined by far. So there's nothing wrong with the game. The game's doing great, mm-hmm. but you know what would that do to attendance in a Tampa or a Kansas City or a Baltimore, or Pittsburgh, or here? Um, would it improve it? Sure. Would the Yankees and Red Sox maybe not sell as many tickets? Maybe, maybe not. But maybe that wouldn't be the worst thing if you went from seventy-five million to eighty, eighty-five million, because some of these other markets could right. do as well, and fans were more bullish. I kind of agree with him. The issue is you got tradition, and the big markets have not consented to helping the smaller markets as much as they should because the salary cap. And I'll just speak from the NBA side. When we started in in eighty-three, I think it was three point six million dollars. Then the salary cap, I think, is going to be eighty-three million dollars this year, and there's a there's a lot of parity, and it weeds out a lot of unethical contracts. There are guys that the NBA learned you can't give a guy a seven-year contract, an eight-year contract, right? The largest extension I think this year is is five years. Five, right? So, mm. yeah, clearly, and baseball is still going the other way. We're still seeing, you know, essentially lifetime contracts. And, and base, being given out. baseball has more expense in the development side. They don't have, uh, you know, mature college players. All of them go through the system. Historically, you know, um, the ethnics have been very successful in coming into baseball and doing very well. And um, But they have a huge expense, a lar- lot larger expense from um, providing inventory of young players than, college, than uh, football yeah. or, or, or basketball. It's a fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time to um, to delve into it because uh, there's all kinds of 
paths that we could uh, go down, but we're uh, pretty much out of time, and you got things to do too. It's uh, great to meet you. Thank you very much for stopping by. Thanks for having me, in. I really and, and you're it. always you're always welcome here. And when you're in uh, when you're in Toronto, you and the O's are in. Well, with that unbalanced schedule, we're going to make make three trips to play all those games. <laughs> so we'll be we'll be back. And, we, and look, great great history and tradition here. I saw a a, a, a Molitor Carter T shirt in uh, in a, in a gift shop today. So that was pretty yeah, cool. The good old days. Yeah, huh? yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the executive vice president of the Baltimore Orioles, John Angelos. We'll take the break. Primetime continues on the Sportsnet Radio and Television Networks.